right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Buddhist Biohacker. I'm so excited. It's been such a busy, fun day today. And welcome, welcome to everybody who's watching live on YouTube, or if you're on the replay later, welcome. And I'm so excited about today's topic, which is dancing with the shadow. And it's with my very special guest, Julie Hoyle. Hi, Julie. Hi. <laughs> This is getting to be old hat having Julie and I on, on YouTube. So I'm happy to have you back again. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really excited. It's one of my favorite themes as well. Um, so it'll be great to dive into that. Yeah. And I think we are just going to dive in. So everybody who's listening live, I see viewers popping in. Welcome, you guys. If you're listening live on YouTube right now, please, please, please feel free to comment and share questions or, it, you know, anything you want to say. Um, I have that up and I'll be able to moderate that. If you're watching later or you're listening on the podcast, there are spaces for you to make comments and questions. So feel free to throw questions to Julie or myself. Um, you know, we'll continue to check in on this as time goes on. So thank you guys for joining. Got lots of folks popping in. So welcome. You guys made it in time for the beginning. So Julie, I want to start out. Um, I know you've shared your story here on Buddhist Biohacker a handful of times now, but what do you want to say about yourself today and who you are before we dive into the shadow? That's a good question. <laughs> and that, it, you know, it seems to change day by day, but you know, anyway, since we have to give ourselves kind of titles and themes, you know, um, the best way of putting it is I'm a transformation coach. Uh, I'm an author, an artist, an educator, um, and I have been writing and speaking about the awakening process for probably close to 20 years now. Um, and that kind of landed in my lap because of what happened to me. I had a really radical, life-changing spiritual awakening that took some time to kind of process and understand. But that has led me to where I am today. So I can speak very directly about the theme that we're exploring because I was thrown into it headfirst without really having a clue what the shadow was. And it was a, it was a, wild, it was a wild ride, that's all I can say. <laughs> Yes. And so what is the shadow? So our topic's dancing with the shadow to make it a little bit more enjoyable for everybody. But what is the shadow? Like there, this is a huge buzzword right now, as you know, it's all over the internet, shadow, shadow energy, shadow work, the shadow. So what is it? Yeah, so so in a nutshell, um, you know, and obviously people have their own descriptors, but you know, the way I describe it is it's the it's the often unwanted, unseen, disowned parts of ourselves that we actually often choose not to want to see and not to want to own. Um, but you know what happens is is when we're deeply unconscious and we're not, we haven't acknowledged, let's say, our anger or our despair or our disappointment, it, it, because we're, we're, we're all energy essentially, we have to find a way of kind of venting or clearing or speaking to that part. So we look outside ourselves and we point fingers at what's wrong with the world or what's wrong with politics or what's wrong with our neighbor or our job or, you know, or whatever the story might be because the needs we need to because we're human we need to give voice to what we're feeling inside even if there's a part of us that is deeply re repressed and deeply disowned and we all know I'm, I'm sure everybody who's watching live today or watches the video later knows more than one person in his or her life that is you know habitually angry or habitually mm -hmm. depressed, or habitually complaining about everything, you know, and that is a result of being deeply unconscious to really what's happening inside oneself. And that really sums up what the shadow is. It's, it's the disowned parts or the parts of ourselves that we do not wish to see, 
um, or the ego chooses not to see, let's put it like that. Um, but, you know, essentially what happens is when you have a radical spiritual awakening or even, you know, a gentle spiritual awakening. Uh, <laughs> is you know, there such a thing? <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess there is. I mean, I know, you know, I know people who just seem to be kind of like moving along very slowly. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess maybe that wasn't my personality. Who knows? I don't know. I, you know, I really can't put that into words. But, but you know, in any event, at some point when you've had a spiritual awakening, you are forced to start looking at the shadow. It, it shows itself and it can show itself really dramatically. Um, or, you know, it could be, again, it could be more gentle. But, you know, certainly... That, the way I like to speak about it is, is through my own direct experience and through story, because I think oftentimes when we tell our stories, it's then easier for people who are listening and hearing, you know, to then be able to relate it to their own story and just to kind of see how that fits rather than speaking conceptually, which really I don't think helps very much. Yeah. Um, so I'm saying all of that to say this, what happened is, I had this re really radical spiritual awakening in 1989, which I won't go into detail about because I've covered it, you know, a few times and written about it. Um, so, you know, I was gifted with the most incredible um, dreams, dream darshans with, an, you know, darshan is to have the sight of, a, a, you know, a master or an enlightened being, a great yogi. And I received teachings from him or her um, and just had really incredible experiences um, from masters and gurus and saints from diverse paths and traditions. And that really lasted for, from 1989. Well, it continues actually, but between 1989 and 2001, you know, those experiences were very um consistent um and they would happen you know almost nightly um very and were very powerful and they would take days to sort of process and i knew absolutely nothing about the shadow all i knew was light and expansion and changes in consciousness and transformation and these amazing beings so it was very sort of blissful um, you know, and just wonderful. I knew enough because I was studying yoga to um, explore what I was feeling. So for example, and in the yogic kind of terminology, it's called Atma Vichara, which means self-inquiry, Atma Vichara. So I knew enough to know that, for example, if I woke up one day and felt really crabby and irritable, um, you know, I, it was important for me to look at what was sitting underneath the irritation, or if I felt a bit depressed or down. Okay, what is this telling me? So I knew enough to look underneath a little, you know, and I'd do my journaling and, you know, and I'd figure it out and, and I'd go my way and everything would be good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then, um, you know, fast forward to 2001, which is when my husband and I packed up everything. We closed down our lives, essentially quit our jobs and we moved to India. We went to live in an ashram and I was just absolutely thrilled and delighted and, you know, felt incredibly grateful about having this opportunity. And, you know, I hadn't gone with any expectations. I was really trying to be very open about what might happen and what I might be able to learn from that experience. But um, I think it was the second night I was there. I had a lucid dream. And in the lucid dream, one of the masters I work with appeared. And she said, the doorway to the astral realms is closed. And there was a door behind her with great big planks of wood across it. Oh, wow. And she was wearing a floppy hat and dark shades, and she was holding a pickaxe. And she said, it's time to go into the basement. Mm. It's time to chip away at the walls. 
But she said, don't worry, it's like sandstone. It falls away really easily. But this feeling of dread just came up in me. And, you know, I didn't know what that meant, but I knew it was going to be really intense. So from that moment on, you know, I'd wake up in this beautiful environment in India. You know, I was in ecstasy, <laughs> being in this place. Yet, you know, anger would come up, depression, despair, all these, uh, you know, and I don't mean just like little waves of it. I mean, like tsunami, a tsunami to the point where some days I could hardly get out of bed. It was just so incredibly powerful and so incredibly dark. And it went on for day after day after day after day. And my little technique of trying to look just below the surface really didn't do anything because I couldn't find the source of where that anger and frustration and irritation and despair was coming from. So I knew that somehow it really linked to being in the atmospheres of this sacred place, but I didn't know what to do with it because I'd never undertaken any sort of psychotherapy I'd never done counseling I didn't understand the psyche you know it was all new to me um so I just said okay and I you know I didn't feel comfortable talking to anybody else about it because I couldn't even put it into words and I knew it was my work I had to do it so I said to myself okay I'll have to meditate on this and just see what happens and hopefully it will dissolve. And it went on, I think, for, yeah, about six months, maybe more, actually. It was a long time. Then what happened was um, I was working, you know, I'd been placed to work in the logistics department where we would be taking care of big events and sometimes two or 3,000 people oh, wow. would come to the ashram. It was a huge job and a huge undertaking and I was working amongst the group of us that were working in the office was a young woman who was an actress she was from Los Angeles and she had been given a project that was very close to her heart and she was really kind of on edge about it because she wanted it to be perfect so one morning she came into the into the office and I was writing something up. I was, I think, typing up some logistics or something, you know, in terms of the timing and so on. And she came in and said, hey, Julie, can you help me with getting this part of this event, you know, set up? So I said, yes, sure. You know, just give me a few minutes and I'll be right with you. And that, you know, didn't make her happy at all. She like coiled up like a cat, yelled at me forget it just forget it and then she dropped f-bombs all over the place <laughs> she was furious because I hadn't just stopped and said yeah let, let's go let's do it so she was just cursing and carrying on and she slammed the door and left the office um so I sat there thinking oh my god I couldn't breathe I went outside and I had to lean against the wall and my head was spinning. And this thought came up and the thought was, how is it possible that such an angry person can be in this sacred place? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, all this stuff that had been coming up in me, I suddenly said, holy cow, you know, oh God this is me I'm describing myself she was just playing her part you know throwing all her anger all over me and I had this huge epiphany that I was actually seeing the kind of the outgoing flow of my own anger but again I didn't know what to do with it so um the next part was I um, was doing some work in the library at, in, at the ashram. They had the most amazing library with every kind of sacred text you could imagine in there. Mm. And so I would just go in once a week to do some dusting and put the books back nicely and just make it look, you know, pretty and everything. So um, I was walking down one of the kind of the aisles and literally a book jumped 
off the shelf and landed at my feet. Oh, wow. And when I picked it up, the book was titled, no, the book was by Mrs. Irina Tweedy, and it was called Chasm of Fire. Mm. And when I opened the book, I read the preface, and this from my memory, it's like I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it said something like, I went to India in the hopes that my guru would show me God, and instead, he forced me to look at the deepest, darkest places within me, and it almost killed me. So I completely recognized right there and then, oh my God, this is what's happening to me. So I started to read up on, um, you know, that book, and she was like detailing her own process, which in many ways was mirroring what I was going through, almost word for word in some instances. And then another book fell forward, and that book was called The Call and the Echo, and it was by a Sufi master by the name of Llewellyn Vaughan Lee. Mm. And that, that book was speaking specifically to dream work, awakening, and working with the shadow. So with those two books, I finally had a kind of reference point with respect to understanding what was happening and that there was a real need for me to work with the shadow and to look at what was coming up um, and to, you know, meet it, have a conversation with it and start working with the energy of what it was here to show me. Um, you know, and that was quite the process. But, you know, one thing I did learn, and and I think it was one of the masters that I'd worked with before he came in a dream and started giving me some kind of pointers about how to work with the energy of the unconscious and the disowned parts you know the shadow mm -hmm. um and I can talk about those you know a little later I'm just kind of going through my story about you know how it all came together but so that was essentially the starting point of me recognizing that there was work to be done on the shadow and that took close to, because we left the ashram, we went to Grand Bahama and I was still doing shadow work for at least 18 months to two years afterwards. Um, because, it, you know, it was really intense. Um, and, and I was really unrelenting. What happened is, as soon as I started to recognize what needed to be done, what I said was, okay, I need to deal with it. I want to go into this as directly as possible. I don't want some kind of slow, milky version of it, you know. <laughs> oh I need to deal with this head on. You know, I'm I want to do it. So, of course, what happened then was um, I would have, because I was raised a Catholic, you know, and the whole kind of everything I'd been taught as a Catholic about the devil. Yep. And going to hell and all those things really showed up full force, I mean, full drama in these really terrifying dreams, you know, and I'd go through one and feel like I dealt with it. And then and I'd have another one and, you know, it went on and on and on, you know, and I don't necessarily need to go into all of that now because I've covered it. I, you know, I spoke about it quite a bit in the book that I've written and then, you know, in various other places, but it was quite the process. Um, but, you know, that one of the great things that, that, that came out of it and what really revealed itself fully is that how long you can go, you know, after waking up and then realizing there's work on the shadow that needs to be done. Because for me, it was like it was 11 years, mm. you know, and I really didn't have a clue. But, you know, the beauty of seeing that, you know, has shown me that you can be a spiritual seeker you can be doing all the work you like you can be meditating for three hours a day and you know doing all your mantra repetitions and doing everything else and still be completely unconscious when it comes to your own darkness your own shadow and you know and i've seen that played out many 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 times where people and you know i think there's a term for it now they call it spiritual bypassing yes 
That is um, yeah. Yeah, with respect to you wanting to appear to be holy and you've got everything together and you know you do all your practices, but you know, there's still this kind of like ball of anger or depression or whatever that hasn't been dealt with. And again, um, Llewellyn Vaughan Lee speaks about this really beautifully. There's a three or four minute video on um, YouTube where he speaks about, um, you know, owning the shadow and the importance of doing the shadow work because he calls it the grounding force to, to really keep, hold you in your body and keep you in your body and, and allow you to be able to embrace the light that you are. Because essentially, until we own the shadow, we can't own our light. Because there'll be that darkness within us that will keep denying the truth of who we are and pulling us away and telling us, well, what about this and what about that? And what about when you get angry and you're still, you know, you're still rubbish at, you know, what, you know whatever the story might be. You know what I mean? I do. So that really has got to be absolute honesty about what we're feeling and owning all of that in order to be able to, you know, stand in the truth of who we are and to be able to allow but the opposites, the yogis call it the opposites, to come together. Otherwise, what happens is we're almost in this half dance with life. You know, we want to embrace those parts of us that we like and we think are palatable and that um you know we're comfortable showing the world and we want to shoo away and turn away from those parts of us that we feel um you know nobody wants to see or you know they they are you know horrible or they're you know evil or whatever story that you know we might be holding inside of ourselves and because it's deeply unconscious for the most part it can be very damaging yeah. You know, and, and uh, you know, a lot of that really is is at the root of why so many people can be so self-negating or self-sabotaging. Whether you know they start some new brand new project and they never carry it through to completion because there's a part of themselves they haven't dealt with with respect to lack of belief or self-hatred, you know, or whatever is in there. So this is a great, great topic. Yes. And I have so many notes. I'm not really sure which questions I want to ask because I have like three different things I wrote down that I'm like, oh my gosh. So I think before I ask some of these other ones, I want to go back to you talking about that radical awakening, because my question for you is, do you think that this global pandemic is a, is a radical awakening for the planet and within that like how how does ever how do we react to that because I don't even have a because that's my question <laughs> <laughs> well that's a good one <laughs> look you know you know the thing I think there's all kinds of theories swirling around about what's really happening with the pandemic you know but you know if we really look deeply at our own lives and we start right there you know we're really truthful about what's happening it seems to be from the people i know the people i work with that, that there's almost like two pathways or two flows of energy for want of a better term where you know people are waking up to what they really want to do with their lives they're they're getting on track with you know being purposeful deciding to write that book they've always wanted to write or create something that they've never had the time for and you know there's energy behind all of that or there's a call to action you know for example with what you're doing with this platform now that's a call to action that you know is clearly um very beneficial and helping a lot of people with respect to trying to navigate what's happening. So there's all of that going on. Then you've got seemingly another sort of track of people that are wanting things to be the same. They're wanting things to get back, you know, the way they were prior to the pandemic. 
you know, they're living in fear, they're full of anxiety, they don't know what to do with themselves, they can't deal with being at home because it's, they've, they've lived, you know, for so long in distraction. Mm -hmm. It's seemingly these sort of two opposites, there's a conflict of that, these two opposites, yet, I think it feels to me like something really amazing is being born out of this, which uh, is really helping people to find a way to connect in ways that they haven't connected before, mm -hmm. to reach out to people in ways that they really haven't kind of bothered to do before, um, to speak truth in a way that, you know, they haven't felt compelled to do before. Because, you know, all of this, and certainly in terms of my own um, response, you know, speaking out, you know, sharing in this way, mm. this is, even though I've written about it, you know, this is very new, um, largely because actually I'd always been told to keep my own process and my journeys and the in initiations and all those things secret. It was important. I was told to keep everything secret until I'd processed it. And then literally, you know, uh, well, when you reached out and asked me to come speak, it's like the whole, it, everything's flipped completely. The energy's completely flipped. And I know it, it's not just me that is happening to, it's clearly happened to you. And it's clearly happening to all those people I know currently who are working to uplift humanity transform humanity and to work with the energy of what we've been given through this pandemic opportunity. Yeah. Well, and do you think that that's why sh the shadow is such a topic right now is because we're, I've heard, I've heard, you know, folks say that they're in their dark night of the soul, like in the middle of this pandemic, because we're forced to sit with ourselves. There yes. is nowhere to point a finger. Right. You know, some and people are, but still to, you know. Still. I know, but stuff. you know, I'll tell you, the other thing is, is all the support systems are taken away, right? So if you've got, especially if you have someone who's suddenly, that you know, they don't have a job or they're having to restructure their work. You've got somebody who, you know, doesn't have as many distractions in terms of just being able to go out and do things and, you know, you know, get distracted. So you've got all those things taken away, which leaves people with having to spend time with themselves and sometimes having to spend time with people in their family that they realize, oh, you know, this relationship isn't maybe as good as I thought it was. You know what I mean? Yep. So you've got, you've got all of that going on. Um, and then for people that really haven't even kind of started on their own spiritual journey, it's really difficult to suddenly be thrown inside themselves and to start looking at fi trying to figure out a meditation practice or a, a practice of self inquiry without having kind of any understanding about even how to do that or reach out and connect with community. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and as just as one example, I mean, I had a lucid dream last night with a family member that has been angry and bitter and just depressed as can be for years and years and years and years. I mean, for years. And um, I've tried to work with him, work with him and work with him and work with him and everything I said, he never heard. Mm -hmm. And yet he showed, last night he showed up in a lucid dream and we were having a conversation and I could see finally, he's kind of brought, been brought to his knees and he's ready to now start looking at what that means for him and how he can transform his life. Wow. Because the point is, you know, with any situation as, you know, as difficult as it might be, there's always an opportunity for transformation. But of course, it depends on your perspective and how willing you are and how open you are to being able to see that there's positives, even in this pandemic, there are positives. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I know that everybody who's listening is like, well, how do I do this? And how long is it going to take? And all the, the linear critical thinking. But before we get there, something popped into my head because you had done the, the shamanic retrieval class in the summit. And my husband and I have been, he's asking all sorts of questions about shamanism. And it's hard to explain because I believe I'm a shaman and I do that work 
But then I'm like, well, I don't really know how to explain it. And something popped up just now when you were talking about having to go to the basement and uh-huh. I think about going to those lower dimensions. And so I wanted to ask what your thoughts are on shamanic work, because in my experience, what I understood, I don't even know if I was told it or what, but it was just what I understood is part of being a shaman versus, you know, I don't even want to say versus a light worker because it's kind of all the same, but like part of being a shaman is they're willing to go to the lower dimensions. They're willing to work with the shadow energies. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on that and what that actually means. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, it would be phrased differently if you are, say, a Tibetan shaman or a Native American shaman or, you know, whatever mm-hmm. title you give to that. You know, again, I'll speak from direct experience because having never studied anything to do with shamanism at all, period, I mean, nothing, you know, I started having these lucid dreams with Native American shamans, Tibetan shamans, shamans from the ayahuasca tradition. You know, they would come and give me teachings and dance and drum. Hopi, Native American Hopis, Indians um, came. You know, and essentially, you know, what it always boils down to is being able to retrieve those parts of yourself that you have become disconnected from or that have come, become disconnected from you through, through trauma, for example. So, you know, as a kid, if you were, let's say you were, you know, physically beaten at home or you had, you know, some awful thing happened to you, oftentimes, you know, to survive it and to be able to deal with it, we kind of separate, a part of us separates off and goes to a safe place. So essentially it's about that. Um, And the work of a shaman is to help a client either be able to retrieve that part for him or herself, or he or she will do the traveling for them and bring that part back. But, but it still requires the kind of the client to be conscious about that and to be willing to do the work with the shaman. Um, so yes, going, going into, you know, kind of for want of a better word, the basement or to go to another realm, an astral realm, is part and parcel of what a shaman will do to help, you know, bring that part, missing part back. Um, you know, and you can actually do it yourself, you know, as I explained in the, in the um, session that I gave last week, but it's really having the tools to understand how to do it more than anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's a good segue into, so how, how do we even do this? Cause I remember, first starting to work on the shadow and even even just seeing and and acknowledging within yourself that you have these ugly parts which I hate to even use that because really they're not but to have these parts of yourself and to to understand them is I, I just remember how it made me feel I mean I was I was so ashamed of myself and I felt angry with myself, like all those same destructive emotions I had about other people I now had about myself. And so how does, how do we do this? Like, how do you start to look at that? How do you even recognize what to look at and what do you do with it once you recognize it? Well, look, let me give you one very simple exercise that this master shaman gave or master yogi gave to me which really helped and it's so accessible, anybody can do it. And he suggested, you know, think about somebody that you really love and really admire. So of course the person that came up for me, and I'll give my own example, because again, it's, I think it's easy for people then to kind of connect in with. The person that came up for me was Mother Teresa, Mm -hmm. because I had always, you know, really honored and respected her and her work and what she stood for. So then he said, you know, write down the qualities in her that you really admire. So I did that, you know, I made a list, you know, and she's very caring, she's kind, she's generous, you know, she's self-sacrificing, you know, and there was a great long list. <clears throat> and then he said, the, you know, the only way that you can see those qualities in that person is if those qualities are in you. So that was, you know, really nice. Then he said, now look at the opposite. What is the opposite? 
of those qualities that I'd listed. So I, you know, I listed caring. So obviously the opposite was, you know, uncaring. She's kind. So the opposite was unkind and so on. So I had the, so I had the opposites. Mm -hmm. And again, he said, those qualities are in you also. Um, and then he said, he asked, he said, he suggested to look at when and why those, those, let's say negative qualities show up in me. So started journaling around, okay, when am I unkind and why? When am I uncaring and why? And I'll, I'll get back to that part in a minute because that was really interesting. <clears throat> so he had me do that. Then the other thing he had me do was look at somebody that really I could not stand, that I just really, I don't want to say hated, but just like, was like, oh, you know, I don't want to spend time with that person. So, um, someone came up that you know was really it's like Ugh. so again it was like make a list of the reasons why you do not want to be around that person and so it was like she's selfish you know she's very conceited she you know is very loud <laughs> there's all these things <laughs> so he said you realize those qualities are in you they have to be, or you don't, you wouldn't see them and you'd be perfectly comfortable being with that person. So then look at the opposites, you know, what are the opposites of, the, of those, you know, which is the flip side of that, you know, which is quiet, you know, so, so, so I made my list. And then, you know, what happened is he said, now look at both the seemingly positive and negative and find what is in the middle. Because what happens is, especially with the seemingly negative, um, you know, with respect to Mother Teresa and me being uncaring and unkind, when I started to journal around when I was uncaring and unkind, I had a huge epiphany because I realized when I was like cold and uncaring and unkind was when I was trying to protect myself from overextending and being overly generous and being overly kind and caring and compassionate and essentially not taking care of my needs. And that then led me to see that the, the reason that that was in place and those sort of characteristics or qualities would come up was because at the time I had no boundaries. I didn't have to say no to anybody. So I would be like trying to stretch myself thin like Mother Teresa and then I'd have to pull back. <laughs> So, you know, that is such a simple, simple, simple thing to do, but it's really insightful because it, it, it really shows us immediately, you know, because everybody can think of people that they really love and want to be with and, that, and the reverse, people that they really can't stand and, you know, have got opinions about. Yeah, well, and I have to share because... You know, you, you took me through that exercise years ago and I'm still doing it, it never ends. Mm -hmm. But I have to share my own epiphany because you're, what you're saying is just reminding me, one of the things that you had said to me, because, you know, you look at, I'm, I'm Irish Catholic, so I have a temper. It's just uh -huh. who I am. And I had to really look at anger, like, why am I getting so angry? And I, I had people get angry at me. It still mm -hmm. happens sometimes where you're like, wow, how'd that happen? And you, one of the things you said, when you look at those traits, you know, and you look at them yes. inside yourself that stuck out to me was you asked me to write down what happens when I get angry. Mm -hmm. And that was when I had a very similar epiphany, which was, whoa, I get mad when I feel like people are overstepping my boundaries. And mm -hmm. Even to this day, I remember writing down because because one of the steps that you had given me was how do I honor anger? Mm -hmm. And I have that. I mean, I swear it's like an affirmation in my brain for the rest of my life. But when I get angry, I say thank you because you're telling me I didn't have functional boundaries with whatever yeah. that situation was. And so it doesn't, anger doesn't go away. And I think that's something for folks to know is like the shadow doesn't go away, but you start to understand what it's telling you. And yes. it makes me laugh instead yes. of 
I'll be like, oh man, I'm so embarrassed. Like I was so mad yesterday, like with the kids or my husband, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, I'm so mad. And then it's like, oh yeah, well, I didn't have space or I didn't say no, or I didn't. It's amazing how it links back. I wrote that earlier when you were talking is how the shadow links to boundaries. It's a real. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and, and what you said has real value because it's easy for people to think that to be spiritual you know <laughs> you should be calm all the time and be kind to the people you know all of that and that really is bs <laughs> you know because at the end of the day there's room for anger there's room for irritation there's room for you know whatever emotion is coming up that, that seemingly is negative right yeah you we make space for it and then you know we honor it we learn it we let it sort of pass through without being hooked in or letting it stay in us for days or weeks or months or years. Yep. My, oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. My favorite video of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, if you guys want to feel like you're human and that that's okay, if you search on YouTube the Dalai Lama and the jealous jealousy around the bird, and he tells this story about how jealous he was about his teacher and that his teacher had this relationship with the bird. And um, I just love that story because it's that reminder that even the Dalai Lama gets angry mm -hmm. and jealous and frustrated, just like the rest of us. It's a real thing. Yes, except, you know, the thing is, it passes through him very quickly. You know, there's a saying, a, a yogic saying that uh, ignorant people are angry and they stay angry their whole lives. Um, a wise person begins to see anger and anger stays with him or her for a week, maybe. Um, and then um, an enlightened being is angry for, you know, a minute or two and it passes through. Mm. Um, and, you know, and that's the truth, you know. Because you, as the minute you start to become conscious about your anger and actually what it's showing you and the lessons it's giving you, it changes everything. And as you said, you can laugh at it. It becomes really humorous as opposed to sitting, you know, and, and, and you know, sitting really heavily, especially when it's unconscious, because when we don't see it, it really has the upper hand um, and it just takes charge and take, takes control. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's unconscious. So it will do, play out and do its thing, um, you know, and it can really destroy lives as we know, you know, yeah. Yeah. Does it ever end, Julie? <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I've often asked that question. I think, okay, the, the best way again for me to speak to that is experientially. I, at least it must've been now, 15 years ago, it's a long time, I had a dream where one of the masters that I've worked with was leading me through a cave and she was walking ahead and kind of watching her footing because there were rocks and boulders all over the place. The path was really narrow. And as we moved through the cave, I started to see a light up ahead. And she said, you, you're coming through the worst of it now, it's over. And I knew she was speaking to the shadow. And I'm not saying that to say that, you know, kind of negative energy sometimes doesn't come up, but it's seen and it doesn't have very much of an effect or an imprint. You know, it's seen, I can laugh at it. Um, and it, it, you know, it doesn't kind of take hold in the same way. So it doesn't trouble me, you know, whereas before, you know, I could get upset or, depressed or angry about something for days or weeks or even you know I don't just say months but you know sometimes people will start talking about something that happened to them five years ago and they're still angry about it I have some folks like that in my family where they're talking about stuff that happened 20 years ago and you think you know what like that was really long time ago <laughs> yes so um you know, and that's, that's the way it works. And the thing is, is because I've spent a lot of time around enlightened masters and, you know, master yogis and so on, you know, I've seen their behavior and I've seen them be very, very angry, but they'll use, they'll use, often use anger as a teaching tool. 
so people sit up pay attention and then it it passes you know what i mean mm -hmm. so um so there's this tremendous force there's everybody sits up takes notice and you know if you're wise about it you take it on as a lesson and a teaching and look at yourself and what is that saying to you um, and there's, you know, there's great benefit in those kinds of emotions because they are so strong and they do get people's attention. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, I forget who, who said this, but there's a great quote about, I think it may have been Carl Jung actually, about when you start looking into the darkness, the darkness starts looking back into you. Mm -hmm. And then there's somebody else that speaks about the numinous darkness, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the the fullness and the brightness of the darkness because essentially when we do start meeting the darkness and speaking with the shadow and inviting it in without you know obviously letting it take over and then you become like you know heavy about the whole thing um then all the energy that was formerly repressed around the shadow suddenly becomes available to you you have a lot more vitality. You're a lot more honest and truthful about who you are, what you do, you know, what your expectations are, if you like it, with respect to having strong boundaries. You know, all those things, you suddenly become much more alive than you were before when you were trying to sort of repress and close down those parts of yourself that you felt were unpalatable, you know? So it's really about bringing everything into life, everything into full force and utilizing it effectively um, and not worrying about, you know, what people think of you because that's a big thing in the West, right? You know, if I step forward and do this, what will people think, you know? Especially in this line of work. I mean, to be a psychic or a healer or any kind of new age, anything. I mean, even that terminology, you know, it's a lot, you take a lot and there's a lot of fear around what we're going to do or how we're going to be impacted if we come out and, and it brings up, I I'm sure you've seen this. Does it not bring up the shadow in people who aren't sharing their gifts it's yes. like there's there's this real need to tell you not to share your gifts. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. Uh, you know, and that again links to that great quote by Saint Thomas about um, if you bring forth what what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you do not bring what is within you it, forth, what is within you, it will destroy you. Mm. You know, and so, you know, I think what happens is when people are really fearful about coming out with their gifts, and, you know, and it's not necessarily about psychic gifts. It might even be creative gifts, you know, or, you know, singing, dancing, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's fear around that of fear of being judged is the big thing or fear of failing is the big thing as well. Then what they'll do is they'll try and sort of uh, put that suppression or, you know, project that onto you to tell you, you know, you shouldn't be doing this or you shouldn't be doing that and kind of trying to contain it and con control it, which is no way to live. Yeah. Like, it's like a half embrace. You're not really living. Um, and that is true, you know, of a lot of people that, um, you know, and, you know, again, I can speak to this because some years ago, I um, was told by one of the masters that she was going to send some people to me from one of the ashrams that, you know, um, staff members were living at. And I was just astonished because they had been studying meditation and self-inquiry and all these things for years and years and years and years and years, some of them for 30 years. Oh, wow. And yet they were afraid. They were afraid to leave the community in case they couldn't come back. They were afraid to utilize their gifts in case it didn't work or they didn't meet with success. They were afraid to actually ask for what they wanted. You know, some of them were afraid to actually say they wanted to be in a partnership and have a relationship. So, you know, I just said, oh my gosh, this again, really shines light on the truth that you can be on a spiritual path for 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years 
you know, know all about meditation, know all about yoga and fasting and mantras and initiations and all of that, and know nothing at all about the psyche and about the shadow and about the importance of integrating, welcoming actually, first of all, and then integrating the energy of the shadow so that you can be fully human and fully alive um, and, you know, have all your vitality and, and energy available to you as opposed to functioning on like 50% or something. What are the, like, what would you say would be the simple steps? Cause I know everybody who's listening is like, okay, this all sounds good. And I think I'm ready. And I see all the things that have come up while I'm in quarantine. Like, what do, what do they do? Like, what, what's the process? Well, I tell you what I would do. The first thing I'd do is I'd buy a journal, right? And have a journal <laughs> on hand. Yeah. You know, and just start, start with those simple exercises. You know, look at the people that you really admire. Because the other part of all of this shadow work as well is that oftentimes people cannot articulate their innate gift, skills, and talents. They have a really hard time. They fumble over it or, you know, they might be able to detail one or two that link to their work, for example, but they might not necessarily be able to get the full spectrum of their gifts, skills and talents. So, you know, I would look at, you know, the people I admire and, you know, why do I admire them? You know, write down those characteristics, then do the opposite and then start having a conversation with why you know, can I be unkind? When, what triggers my unkindness? You know, if you do those very simple practices, it will start to really take the lid off what you have may, you know, mainly been not, you know, not wanting to see or not wanting to own. And that, that's true with the positives as well as the seeming negatives. It's, it's two sides of the same coin, actually. It's, this, it's one and the same. And when you start having a conversation with both those sides of the coin, you come, somehow you come into the middle, the middle place, if you like, for want of a better term. Mm -hmm. And also it, it, it really does create incre incredible compassion within you because you have an understanding about where other people are coming from. You're able to be really compassionate with respect to you know, seeing how they're closing themselves down because we can all see that. You don't have to be psychic, you know, to understand and see that, right? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> but, it's true. but we don't get so kind of irritated or, you know, in despair about it because, because we've seen it within ourselves. We have um, a question in here. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, oh, wait. They retracted their question. <clears throat> oh, well, well, anyway, it was asking, <clears throat> I luckily I read it before it went away. The question was asked, you know, what if you look at that stuff and you still like, you, you still don't understand the process. Like what, what is really being missed there? Hopefully I paraphrase that. Okay. Cause it went away, but. <laughs> what is but being missed when you yeah, what is being missed? The question was, you've, you're you starting to write down those traits and you're looking at them and you still aren't really seeing past that. What is being missed is what their question was, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, so maybe it's to do with not wanting to take ownership mm. of the positive or the negative. So I would look at, you know, what is it that I'm not choosing to see here? Because, you know, I think it's true of anybody. If you ask anybody, you know, who do you admire? Everybody, I would think, would be able to come up with at least one person, right? And that also, the person does not have to be alive. That person can be long gone. But there's something in that person that we admire, you know, and we can articulate with respect to their, their, their talents or their gifts or, you know, their personality. And then we just flip to the opposite. And we can ask, you can keep asking questions. If you feel like you get stuck, you can just give it, you know, give it a bit of sort of breathing space and then come back to it. Or another way of looking at it is you can ask the universe, can you please show me 
but that was another thing I did. I said, look, can you, if I'm, sometimes I can be quite dense. So universe, can you please show me, knock me on the head if you have to, if there's something that I'm not seeing with respect to the shadow, can you bring somebody full and center into my space that speaks directly to what I need to take ownership of? Mm. So cause, you know, that was a big ask and I got a big response. <laughs> say watch what you ask for so yeah yeah but i was like you know i need to i need to understand what this is um because i could feel that i wasn't fully engaged with my vitality i knew that you know it wasn't it wasn't fully with me and i wasn't fully present with it i mean we can feel it yeah it, you know even if you can't i you know articulate specifics you can you just know that you know something isn't is something is off or you're disconnected in some way and that you need to see clearly what is going on so you know when i ask that question just have these people show up or some event show up because i started getting you know really really angry people at the bank <laughs> or in the food store or you know i remember one time I mean, it was, it's hilarious when I think about it now, but I just was like, yeah, I need to know, I need to see, you know. So I went to the food store to buy, you know, a few items and I put them on the conveyor belt and the girl is there. The, this is the irony of ironies, right? She's reading a Bible. She's got the <laughs> Bible. <in. laughs> and then she's just like pulling my stuff, food through, right? It, and then it went on the floor. She, flew, she threw this loaf of bread oh, so hard. God. It ended up swimming across the um, conveyor belt and onto the floor. There's like two <laughs> food items on the floor. <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, I get it. You know, disengaged, you know, angry that you're actually having to do something that you don't want to do. And at the time I was in a job where I really felt overwhelmed and I'd been handed a schedule that was ridiculous that nobody could keep up with, but because I didn't have any boundaries, yeah, that was what was going on. So she was a perfect, a perfect example for me, you know, because she was just not into it and didn't want to be there and was pissed, you know, I was like, yeah. <laughs> You know, the thing is, is just ask if you're not clear on anything to do with the shadow, just ask, but you have to be prepared because <laughs> <laughs> you will be shown what you need to see. Yeah. Uh, you know, in ways that you really could never, you know, you could never imagine. Yeah. Well, and, uh, that brings me to a question um, also about that. And, you know, do you think it comes my experience with my shadow has been like layers, like where it's the same pattern. It's the same yeah. thing, but now I'm seeing it and it, it's like, you keep seeing it in different ways. And so yes, I wonder... yes that, that is absolutely true. And that's a really good point. Um, and what happens is, and, and again, I'm, you know, speaking experientially, it may be different for other people, but what yes. I've found is, it would be really big and really loud and almost shocking in the beginning. And then over time, even if it came up, you know, in a different way or a different form, it would have less bite. It would be, oh, it's there again, but it's kind of more gentle or it had softened or because the, the, here's the, tr here's the real truth is that, you know, what becomes conscious, what you become conscious of, you can no longer pretend not to see hmm. so the more you see it the less kind of hold or impact or impression it makes on you it's just like oh it's there again but no big deal and you can kind of laugh at it as yeah, opposed yeah. to you know in the first instance just being just so shocked it's like oh my god yeah, I, I I feel that feeling like I've had that happen recently and it was like at first I was like really caught in it and then it's like oh wait a minute like I think this is and you'd let it go and you know yeah. keep going I, 
I want to ask about so in in the world of the shadow there's these fun buzzwords and I say that because I think that's part of the spiritual bypassing piece is to use some of this language and there's a lot of oracle card I think I've read every oracle card deck ever and they use the same two words integration and crystallization it's always about integration and crystallization and oh the yin and the yang it's crystallized and so what does that really mean like does it does it even matter what it means but like what does that mean yeah you know i i don't you know i really don't concern myself too much with buzzwords because it doesn't really really mean a whole lot again you know from my own experience <clears throat> the thing that i i find has great value <clears throat> excuse me is rather than using the word integration using the word you know processing just processing which i know is just, you know a different way of saying it but which is essentially the same thing so so really becoming conscious and then working with the en energy of what you're being shown so that you glean some understanding from it and you're not separate from it with respect to the shadow for example with the word crystallization, for me, it feels a little like a bit sort of solid and yeah, um, a bit dense. I, mm -hmm. I, I prefer to think of it in terms of clear seeing because mm. seeing has a way of looking through. Whereas with crystallize, it feels more about kind of getting stuck and very rigid about, <laughs> you know, yeah. about seeing the shadow, for example, and you know, and it's never really like that because there's, there's always fluidity, there's always movement. Um, and you know, it will show up in ways that you're not expecting it to. So if you, the thing that you have to be very clear about is not creating a concept about what the shadow is because the minute you create a concept and you expect it to turn up a certain way or you try and label it a certain way, then you're going to be missing a lot of what the shadow is all about because mm. of the fluidity and the movement of it, if that makes sense. So I right. prefer to, to, to think in terms of just seeing through it and then processing what you're seeing. And then it feels it's looser, it's more expansive. You know, it feels less like hard work. There's kind of a joy to it. Because, you know, essentially the shadow is just the light in darkness. It's just, you know, that's what it is. And it's here to teach us something and to show us something and to really gift us with new awareness about who we are and what we've been trying to separate away from. Mm. And, um, you know, it's really time to bring that back and to really... Um, to integrate everything in a way that's healthy and whole. And it, it includes our humanity and our humanness, as opposed to trying to be, you know, the spiritual like person that's perfect all the time, yeah. which isn't real anyway. It's a, <laughs> it's a fantasy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all have our moments, right? <laughs> yes. yes. Where we can play that one really well. <laughs> But hey, you know, it's much more fun to be real and to be authentic and to just let, you know, emotions play their part without getting pulled into the drama of, you know, what's going on. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's really about being in truth and to being, you know, in integrity and to living from that, living in and from that place of authenticity, which includes everything the shadow and the light oh i love it julie i'm so glad you were on today and talked about this, this is a really important topic i mean i think it's not only up for everyone but it's worth doing i think it's worth doing the work i mean yes it's not fun but it can be fun at the same time <laughs> yeah so sure. you know and look you know the beauty of it too is you know even if it might feel a bit like uncomfortable when you're doing it the benefits so outweigh any discomfort. It just is so incredible because, you know, the other side of that is, is, you know, when you start working with the energy of the shadow, these gifts start coming up that you, you know, didn't, never even knew that you had. 
I know, you know, one of the things that came up for me through that period was, was the ability to be able to write, you know, and to be able to express myself through word and then, you know, intuitive painting and then being able to speak about it, you know, you know, so all those gifts suddenly become available to you that were kind of held back and held in check before mm -hmm. because of being afraid or being closed down in certain areas of your life out of, you know, out of fear. So, you know, the benefits for sure definitely, definitely outweigh anything that any bit of discomfort, you know, the discomfort doesn't last that long anyway, right? Yeah. It's just, no. it's, it's a bit of shock and then it's okay, I've got work to do, let me go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. and here it comes again. Oh, let me check that one again. <laughs> yep, so. yep. Time to get out the journal, ask the questions. <laughs> You know, and look, the, 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 the other thing that really helped me, and I think this might help people that are listening in, is that every single saint, every sage, every siddha, every master, every light, enlightened being has been in our shoes with respect to working on the shadow, because it's not possible to attain the highest state without moving through the darkness you get to the light by moving through the darkness and that really helped me enormously when I was you know doing the work um you know and it also gives you some understanding about their capacity to for compassion I mean you think about his holiness and his capacity to be compassionate you know I mean you think about all the abuses he went through as a child you know, having to leave his home and all those things. And his answer when he's asked about that is always about compassion and forgiveness. And that really is the result of having done the work, you know, with the shadow. And I'm sure that was part of his, um, well, you know, when he was growing up and he was, he was learning and he was being taught, he was, I'm sure he was being taught all of that in the practices and initiations he was given. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it really is. Um, so, you know, the, the darkness of the shadow is an ally. It's here to teach us about ourselves and to teach us, you know, about the gifts that are lying dormant. And it also is here to, to give us strength and courage. Because if you can face that, you can pretty much face, you know, anything. Yeah, I feel like I wasn't able to love myself until I loved my shadow yeah and, and and that's even really just been in a real way in the last few months really six sure. months probably I mean you really there's a change and it's hard to articulate but there is a change like once you can love those aspects it you do become whole and it's like yeah. oh I actually care about myself then then those functional boundaries are easy Yes, because you want there's value there that you didn't have before. That's what yeah. I felt. Yeah, absolutely. Be you know, <clears throat> certainly in my case, the need in me to keep saying yes to everything came from a you know a lack of self worth, and um, you know not loving who I was and all of those things. You know, and a lot of that was you know ha it ha a lot of that happens in childhood and you know what we're taught and so on and so forth, but you know, that really does change dramatically when you start working on the shadow because you get to see those things and see what you're doing to yourself. And it's really, it's a game changer. It really is. And the thing as well is if you're working with people, you know, in the way that you and I work with people, then you have to be whole. You have to have integrated and done that work to be able to speak from a place of authenticity. And the beauty of it too is that you don't even have to be speaking about the shadow or about you know the work that you've done because your state does the work for you. Your state speaks to your clients. They know they can trust you because you have been where they may be now and they know that, that you can help them. So, you know, your state reveals always you know, where you are and, and, and reveal, reveals the work that you've done. 
mm-hmm. which again, you know, is when I keep referring to his holiness because you've been in his presence. You can feel his presence from, I, I, you know, <laughs> I'll just say a mile away. You know, he's <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, because of the work he's done, he doesn't even have to say anything, right? He walks yeah. into a room, you feel his presence. And the same is true with an enlightened being. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, you know, not that we're all, you know, we're aspiring to be saints and, uh, you know, but the thing is, is that, you know, everything we do with respect to committing to the shadow work speaks volumes. Because people feel they can be themselves. They don't have to put on some kind of fake mask or personality to try and sort of impress and, you know, they can just be who they are. Yeah. Um, So, you know, really the more awake people we have in the world, the more honest people we have, the more people true to themselves, the better off we'll be. And this really is the work this is what we're all being called to during this pandemic, as you know, terrible as it might look. This really is the crux of everything. It's, it's, it's about coming into alignment, being true, being authentic, living into our calling, whatever our calling might be, you know, whether that's being on the front line with patients or staying home looking after the kids, you know, whatever that is. But, you know, being true to that calling and, and living from that place of integrity. And you can only do that if you've done the work with the shadow. Well, and it's exhausting to put on all those faces. And it's so much. I have more energy now. I remember being exhausted all the time. And I think like now, like I'm doing all sorts of things and I don't even know where the energy is coming from. But I am having this like realization even as you're talking like because I can be myself I actually love everything I'm doing and I feel happy and I feel full of energy and that's worth doing the shadow work so you're not having to exhaust yourself trying to be everything that everybody wants you to be all the time because you just can't do it it's impossible exactly you know and here's another side of all of that too which is which is really valuable I think when you're coming from a place of authenticity and you have this kind of inner message to step out and do something, let's say, you know, write a book or like, like you've done to create this platform, there's no space between hearing it and stepping it in, into action because you trust what you're hearing inside. You step into the action of it. And the beauty of it is, is, is there's no fear around looking bad or failing I, you know I never when I get an intuition to do something I never ever think what if it's a mess what if I fail what if I sound bad or look bad I don't honestly don't care because I know I trust that what when I'm given something the tools and the way uh, to be able to do it will be given and it will work out the way it's supposed to work out so this, in other words, there's nothing that holds you back. I mean, sometimes your mind might say a few things, but there's really nothing in terms of a really big or strong pull that holds you back because you've already dealt with the shadow. You've already dealt with those aspects of yourself that might say, oh, wait, hold on a minute. You know, you won't be able to cope or it'd be too much for you. So that's another side, another benefit of, of working with the shadow energy. Because it's essentially just your own energy you're working with. Yeah. Oh, I could talk to you for hours about this. We've already <laughs> talked for an hour. Oh, have we? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure Dancing with the Shadow Part 2, 3, 4 will come out for everybody listening. Um, but I really thank you for taking the time to talk about this and and for everybody listening Um, I will put those books in the show notes. I'll put the link to His Holiness's video um, where he talks about the bird, Um, a book that really supported me that I'll put in the notes as well is Carl Jung's Memories, Dreams, Reflections. I mean, it just, it's another one that just opens up this energy for you and to understand it better. 
Um, so I'll get all of that stuff in there. And for everybody who's listening, we are having a weekend watch party for this summit. And I highly recommend watching Julie's, um, all three of your, your workshops or classes or whatever you want to call them were amazing. Um, but I do think that in regards to the shadow topic, the shamanic retrieval techniques is a really good one. And also the honoring your soul contract, but even the lucid dreaming, because that's a process. That's like a whole separate podcast because you, Julie, were the one who taught me that you can do so much work in your dream state. It Mm -hmm. saves you so much time. It's like very efficient. Yes, it is. (laughs) It's so efficient. And, um, that's that, that, uh, podcast is on its way because that's another way to do it. So, um, anyways, I'll get all this stuff in the show notes and watch those other workshops and videos because that will help you as well. And I know you have lots of courses available. Um, Julie's information and her website will be in the show notes as well, both on YouTube at Buddhist Biohacker and also on the iTunes and Spotify links as well. So that'll all be available to you guys to be able to find her, to be able to find the information. I'm pretty sure I'm going to read these two books. Not that I need more books to read, but I'm going to do it. Um, Any parting words? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. One book I would recommend, I I think I recommended it to you years ago, Lisa, was a a book called A Little Book on the Human Shadow Mm -hmm. by Robert Bly. And it's really, I mean, there's not that many pages to it. It's really a very easy, simple read. Uh, And the other thing I did want to offer, if people want to, you know, get get to know a few more very accessible, simple techniques, if you email me, I can send a PDF out with, you know, a few more kind of options that will, you know, help people just kind of get into the practice of doing the work on the shadow. Because sometimes, you know, that's the tricky part, isn't it? It's knowing, okay, what practices can I do? So I'd be happy to send that out. Um, my email address is truealignment at yahoo.com. Uh, you know, and I can get that out to folks if they're interested. Um, and apart from that, you know, there isn't much more to say other than, you know, good luck with everything and uh, just keep working because it's really, really worth it. It really is. And I am so grateful that I, that I met you because of so many reasons, but the shadow work was that was huge for me. That was, it has been and continues to be everything for me mm-hmm. and not being afraid of it. I believe is how I've healed physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Like I do what I do today because I was brave enough to look at it Yeah, and it's, it's worth it. And we're all being forced to look at it right now. So do it. And save some time and energy and just do it while you're sitting at home in quarantine. <laughs> yeah, you've got that right. Oh, and the, what, one more thing I did just think of as well <laughs> is uh, if folks listening haven't read the book, I've written a book, um, An Awakened Life, A Journey of Transformation. There's a whole chapter on the shadow and how to work with the shadow in the book. And they can get a free copy of the book. I'll give them that by going to my website, juliehoyle.org. Um, and hitting, you know, it comes up on the opening page, uh, put the information in there and then I'll get, get that to them as soon as I can. Oh, good. Yeah. You guys, I waited a long time to read that book because I didn't want it to influence what I was doing. And, um, now I have, and it is, it is really amazing. So you guys, it's a treat to get it, to get that for free. So. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody listening. And thank you to everybody who is um, commenting and questions and all that good stuff. And um, we will be back again. We'll have Julie back on and um, Buddhist Biohacker will be back live with a podcast next week on Wednesday. So Yay. yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about um, beauty at home, which is a fun different kind of topic. And then I'll be on with Tari Ward also. So we'll be talking more about the psyche, I think. So. Oh, lovely. Yeah. yeah. Very Thank exciting. You. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank much. everybody listening and take care. Thank you. Bye.